but I think I'm just going to jump in. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It is such a, um, a pleasure to be here. Um, this is my really, hey, Danny. This is my really super favorite thing to do. In the, the, So there are hierarchies. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, and number one favorite big category is healthcare and medical because I feel like oftentimes the family perspective is um, not forgotten by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not necessarily the priority. So it's always really fun for me to go to a medical convention and have people come up and say thank you for reminding us of that. But then the, the subset of that, my most favorite, is to speak to nurses. And I have spoken to a number of the national nursing groups. And I was saying earlier, we had a tea at the, uh, at the school that it is routinely the one group of people that I speak in front of that I always end up crying somewhere up here on the podium. So I hope you'll forgive me in advance because I additionally have my daughter here who I don't think has ever heard me speak. So um, that's also kind of super emotional because she's obviously just a huge part of this entire journey. And she was the cute little girl teaching the word belt buckle. And so you were all, and then laying her head down on her daddy's chest. And, and so much of what I want to talk about is the importance of the family in coming together in the role in healing. But I cannot watch that video anymore. And my own sweet daughter was admonishing me for looking at my iPhone while it was playing. But I have seen it 192 times. And you're all focused on that amazing moment where my children truly are teaching their father who was brain injured on his left side of his brain in his Broca's area where his speech and language resides, truly teaching him to say words again. But every time I'm looking in the left-hand corner where my daughter Claire is picking her nose and eating it. <laughs> and I'm gonna guess that you didn't see that, did you? Maybe there's a reason we should put the video on one more time. <laughs> But I look back at that, that moment, I think, where was that mother? And look at, the, look at the clothes they were wearing, and who was washing their clothes furthermore, and why, did, why does their hair look like Don King, and no one, had, no one had brushed it? And it's a testament, as you all know, especially in the profession of nursing, to those moments where you are just pressed so hard to the wall that you're getting simply through the day, and that's a, an accomplishment. I think the wonderful thing about life is that we are all connected, ultimately, in those moments. We will all experience grief. We will all experience fear and loss. We will all lose somebody we love. We will all lose our parents at some point in time. And, and I think it's that commonality, it's that understanding of sort of the rougher parts of the road that really connect us as human beings. But nowhere is that connection drawn more wonderfully than in the setting that those of you who are currently nurses or in the medical profession or are in nursing school, you really are doing God's work. Because whether or not you think about it on a daily basis or you understand it as you're going through what your rounds are, you have the ability not only to heal, let's just set that one aside for a second, but you have the ability in your brief intersection with us, even if it's a smile in the hallway, to change our day as a family member. You're seeing us at our absolute worst. You're seeing us, probably most of you, unless those of you are in plastic surgery and doing boob jobs and other enhancement things, which is probably, and, and, and also on the OB end, most of you are probably seeing human beings at their absolute most fearful, or their most grieving, or their most searching. So when I think about nurses, what I think about is that you have this divine moment to intersect with us and ease that pain. And that is something that most people don't get to do. I think the other incredible thing about nurses is that you put aside your own baggage, whatever issues are going on in your life. What am I gonna do about my taxes? How am I gonna pay this credit card bill? My husband left his dirty underwear two inches from the laundry basket again, I wanna wring his neck. And you walk in the door of your workplace, your hospital, your clinic, wherever you may be, and you have to put that aside to deal with me. And I may be in a variety of places. I may be in a world of hopelessness. I may be searching for an answer for something. I may be angry. 
I may be anywhere along that spectrum. And so not only are you healer, but you're also armchair psychologist or psychiatrist. And that, again, makes you someone with an extra special sense um, as you move through the world and as you move through the day. So I hope today, and I'm going to leave some, some time for questions as well, um, I hope that, that I can just kind of remind you about why what you do is so special. And for those of you who have chosen this as your area of school, um, I want you to understand what you're about to step into because it's, it's truly one of the few professions I can think of where you can directly impact how somebody moves through their life after or during a traumatic experience or doing it during an experience where you can ease them through it and allow them to move on through the world in as healthy and as positive a way as possible. Well, our story um, was one that happened, it's hard for me to imagine, seven years ago. And I think I'm going to spend more time on, on talking about the intersection of nursing than I do, and I, I'm going to be mindful of the time as well, um, on, our, on our absolute story. The video sort of sets that up. And so we had really an in an instant moment where Bob was headed off to cover uh, where we were in the war, which at the time was, uh, he was going over to cover President Bush's State of the Union address. And it was a point in the war where we were standing down and the, we were training the coalition forces to take up more of the patrolling. So um, it was a simple assignment. And he was jumping over there for a couple days and jumping back. So when I got the phone call, out of the blue that he had been hit by a roadside bomb and it was his boss calling and basically saying he's taken shrapnel to the brain um, and he's about to go into surgery. Um, you know, what, do you, what, what are you going to do? What can you do? Tell us what you want to do. Um, I said, give me, and the, it was six hours ahead, so it was, they were having a hard time containing the news, and the other journalists were respectful of the fact that the families needed to be contacted, so they were holding the news back. But I walked outside. Uh, we were in Disney World, of all places, which is why Bob had that stupid Mickey Mouse hat on, by the way. That and the fact that Disney is the parent company of ABC. Um, <laughs> which, I'm going to put this plug in here in case I forget. For any of you who are still watching today's show, Good Morning America, you do need to give the CBS Morning News with Gail King and Charlie Rose a check. There are no Kardashians. It's a no Kardashian zone. Um, we've, we've gone back to real news on CBS. Uh, but that was the mouse ears. I feel like always compelled to explain that. You know, that wasn't part of his brain injury. He wasn't talking like Mickey Mouse and walking around the room. The word I got was that it was life or death, sort of the surgery was going, the surgery to remove 16 centimeters of Bob's skull was um, needed to, of course, take place in emergency circumstances. And I remember Dr. Tim Johnson, who I believe is a Boston resident and a wonderful man and a minister, uh, calling me and we were on the tarmac of the, of the plane ready to, to fly out of Disney. We, we actually happened to be in a great place if we were away from home because being the parent company, they completely set us up, got us out of there. And Tim said, you know, Lee, there's a really good chance that Bob won't make it. Are you sure that you want to be in the air while he's, you know, undergoing surgery? And this was the practical Yankee-ish side. of I grew up in Albany. We sort of are half Yankees, right? We're just across the border from Massachusetts. And I thought, well, if he's going to die, he's going to die. And I would so much rather be in the air moving forward toward home than I would be in Disney World and have my husband die. And I think Tim was a little stunned that that was my answer. But um, he was, I remember how gracious he was. And I remember thinking, this is the right way to get a message delivered this way. I'm going to jump back because I want to talk about the amazing care, um, the continuum of care that Bob received, which is really one of the first line reasons why Bob is back at work, back as a father, back as a husband. I need to say this because I always forget this, and then somebody always raises their hand and says, how is your husband? And I always say, oh, I kind of forgot that part. But he truly is a medical miracle. I mean, you saw that rock 
video, and I'll talk about that in a second, but there isn't anybody who doesn't, in the medical world, who doesn't look at his charts or know his story or understand the gravity of his injuries and say, I can't believe he's alive. And Bob is a testament, I think, to the fact that there are miracles out there. And I'm gonna touch on this a little bit later in my talk, but one of my big important points is that there are things that happen in healing that we don't understand, that we can't explain, and you've all seen them. You've seen that patient who's defied all the odds, whose tumor shrank, whose whatever it was. And one of my biggest messages, for those of you who are using this for CE, is you cannot take away anyone's ability to hope or believe in a miracle. And there are lots of ways to parse hope, and there are lots of ways to, to deal with that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But that was the, the most important thing that Tim did for me initially, was not to try to beat me over the head with statistics and tell me what he knew about a brain injury. He let me begin to move down the highway of my own journey with how I would accept this, how much information I would let in, and what I wanted to know. Bob was hit. Rocks came up 25 yards, uh, feet away from him. He was in the top of the tank doing what's called a stand-up in the news business, and he was just about to go under because the, the diesel engine was so loud, it was really blocking out the microphone's ability to tape. And just as the front gunner was saying, we should go down, there's a palm of stand, a, a stand of palm trees uh, over here, which was typically a place where insurgents would, would hide out. The bomb went off, and it was packed with rocks. And some of these IEDs are packed with broken glass or nails, and the worst ones, and for those of you who are in, in burn units or have spent any time in a VA with some of our, our service members who are burned, have some kind of an incendiary device in the bomb that will just you know ignite the skin. I think some of the most amazing veterans I've met are some of those who have sustained major burns over their bodies. Um, they're in one of the, the video pictures in the, in the longer version, there's a young man who had over 100 surgeries to repair um, his burns, was burned over 89% of his body. And I did not know this, not being a medical professional, the reason he survived was that his windpipe wasn't burned. And that if you, you know, take in the flames in your windpipe, you're a goner. I learned lots of little medical trivia in my journey. I feel sort of uh, that I stepped into this world of traumatic brain injury, TBI, three letters I didn't even know existed or what they stood for. Bob went down. He fell back in the tank. He hit the back of his head where they believe that he probably hit the optic nerve that runs back there somehow. So he's got a sort of a pie-shaped wedge out of the left side of his field of vision, which really doesn't change anything. He can drive, he can you know, play sports. If you are, find yourself playing tennis with him, you want to bring him up to the net and lob because that's his one blind spot. <laughs> and it was so interesting, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here and I tend to, to sort of speak in a conversation because I think after six years of doing this, if I were reading from notes, I'd probably have a gun to my head. But um, it was so interesting to watch him recover and compensate for his injuries because he would just begin to take the newspaper and just move it out of his blind spot. And I don't even know if he was aware of doing that, but the amazing compensatory strategies of our brains, our brain's ability to regenerate. How many, are, are any of you thinking, those of you who are students or who are currently working go, about going into the field of neuro? Um, in any way, yeah, I'm so excited for that. As someone said to me, it's where the heart was 25 years ago, and obviously our brains are so much more complicated, but I think we will make so many advancements in the coming years in the neuro field, and watching it firsthand, watching Bob's brain reboot, watching the, the capacity for the brain to regenerate and create new pathways was just, was truly an incredible experience as his wife. He fell back in the tank, three rocks went up under his flak jacket and shattered his scapula, but it was really the the rocks that had hit the left side of his head. That one rock actually cut through the chin strap of his helmet. So they found his helmet about a, a hundred yards away. And that was the rock that literally went all the way through his neck. As one doctor said to me, your valuable real estate where you talk and chew and breathe and swallow. I hadn't really thought about the neck that way before. I just thought of it as a place that always gets wrinkled and you can't really fix it. And, <laughs> It wouldn't be until they took the trach tube out that we would know whether or not it had been damaged. So for those five weeks before Bob woke up out of his coma, I would have to live with the uncertainty of knowing if he could talk or breathe on his own or swallow or any of that damage. 
He fell back in the tank. They radioed to the base and the medics in the helicopter, and they were dispatched. And then a gunfight broke out, because the goal in the war is to just injure or maim somebody, and then all the guys come piling out of the vehicles, and then the insurgents try to pick them off. So when the gunfight started, they radioed back to the medics and said, turn around. It's too dangerous to land here. You, you need to go back to base and wait for us to come back. And in what I consider to be what distinguishes your profession from so many others and what makes you so special, these two young men who were 25 and 26 and were medics and probably are nurses someday now, looked at each other and the one guy said, did you hear anything? The other guy said, I didn't hear anything. And they turned the radio down. They landed that helicopter. They got Bob out of there. They got him back to, uh, to uh, Baghdad, which at the time was the, sort of the, the triage center. Assessed him, of course, as critical. There, was no, there were no other seriously wounded or more seriously wounded people in the hospital at that point in time. Because if there had been in a triage situation, Bob's nurses, who we've had the amazing pleasure to meet as we've traveled around the country, uh, many of them reservists, and many who were just, you know, have cycled back and through these wars and into the, hosp into the hospitals and, uh, and operating rooms there. She, Bob's nurse, Deborah Mule, who was a colonel in the Army, uh, a nurse when she retired a few years ago, said to me, he would have been in the back of the bus. He was that critical. I mean, none of us, we all took a look at him and we all thought, he's not going to make it. And she said to me, even seven, even, you know, seven years ago or five years ago, we would have taken a look at wounds like your husband's, and we might have just kind of pushed him around the corner and let, let God take him. And she was also talking a lot about the Vietnam War, which those guys just simply didn't survive. But they then got him from Baghdad to Balad, which is when I'm having a bad day and marshals won't take my shirt back, this is what I think of as a bad day. And, and we were just talking about that earlier. This is a hospital run on generators, constructed out of tents, and while they were sawing 16 centimeters of Bob's skull off, these doctors and nurses were taking mortar fire on their base. They wear flax, and they just kept going. Flak jackets, meaning. Imagine operating under those circumstances. And yes, you can imagine what it must take to put someone else's life before yours. Because the nurses I know and the nurses that I've been with do that every single day in various ways. You might not be wearing flax, and you might not be on a base in Balad. But what I think of as what it takes to be someone who's exceptional in this field that's one of the qualities, to simply decide that someone else's life is a priority right now, no matter what is happening in your own life. Bob uh, was taken to Bethesda Naval, and that's where he lay for five weeks before he came out of his coma. And he really did come out in that sudden of a way. It was, really, it was pretty incredible. There were so many challenges during that period in time. And I, I remember coming into the, the room at first when Bob had been flown from Germany. And they get the guys back within 72 hours because of the incredible capability to put them on these hollowed out C-17 planes. But I saw a phalanx of white coats looking at me. It was internal. It was maxillofacial, ortho, you know, neuro, you name it. And as they went around and sort of gave their report, all I was sort of hearing was probably won't be able to, can't, you need to know, blah, 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 blah. And I was still just sitting there thinking, wait a minute, my husband's been hit by a bomb? I was still back on cognition one, just trying to process that news. We had two really great friends in Washington who are both doctors, and they were sort of the ombudsmen who would explain to Bob's parents what the doctors were saying and what was going on. But when I really needed information, when I really wanted to know what was going on, it was my nurses that I turned to. And I would learn as I navigated the system and the, the concept of the uncertainty of a brain injury and how it, at the lack of percentages. I mean, I thought like with cancer and with some of these other diseases, you get a percentage. So you can fight against that. Okay, you've got 70% chance of licking this cancer. We had nothing. A brain injury, as you all know, is as individual as the person 
who gets it and is so dependent on how much that person has going into it and the nature of the injury and the location of the injury. So I needed to stay in the world of hope before I could understand where this was going to go. What I loved about my nurses is they were able to parse hope in a really important way. And I have a lot to say um, to the docs, and we were laughing about this earlier, but you know, you find your person that is able to communicate with you. One of my friends who's a doctor said to me, she's a, she's a teacher as well, and she said, on my first day of med school with my students, I put a slide up of Van Gogh's shoes, the picture of Van Gogh's shoes, and I say to my students, you need to learn to stand in these shoes. Because if you think of your patients as someone's daughter or brother or mother or sister as yours, then your ability to communicate and empathize and sympathize with them will be that much greater. And their ability to recover or to move through whatever it is they're going to face will be that much better because you've delivered the information to them in a wonderful way. I still think I have caregiver PTS from the way that news was delivered. And I have two things to say about news. I have, I, I, my big message really is about hope and that there are so many ways to deliver bad news while still allowing for that window of hope to stay open. Because without hope, what incentive did I have to get up every single day and walk into that ICU room and try to continue to make this go in the right direction? My nurses would say all kinds of things to me. Keep talking to him, they said. Somewhere inside that brain, he's knitting it back together. You just keep talking to him. They told me to bring music in. They told me to ignore the people that were saying that it wasn't going to go in the right direction because they didn't really know. Those doctors didn't really know anything. We know so little. It's in such an infancy in this entire field and that they had seen amazing things. And they continued to, to prop me up along the journey by not by giving me a percentage or telling me that they had some third eye and they knew how this was going to turn out. They did it by sharing the stories with me. And that was the most powerful thing that they could do for me in the absence of any real information. Let me tell you about the guy, they'd say, who was in here, the veteran. He was 52 years old, had a stroke. We were never sure he'd be able to walk again. And you know what he's doing now? And they would tell me. And those little stories became the way that I would find the nourishment that I needed to keep that open window of hope. It was more powerful than anything that any of the doctors could have said. Bob had uh, underwent surgery to get rid of that rock, and it was a really scary surgery. It was a very complicated surgery because it was leaning against the carotid artery. That was miracle one, that that rock went all the way through his neck, touched nothing, and was leaning against the carotid artery on the other side. I believe that the hand of God sort of said, okay, stop, rock. You're going to be our face poster boy for this because, as Bob's neurosurgeon said to me in the hospital, there are thousands of young men and women out there in this country cycling through these two hospitals with these injuries and these hidden injuries from the war. And nobody in America really knows any of this is going on. That was seven years ago. No one was talking about traumatic brain injury. And Bob became the person who was able, thank God, because of how he recovered, to say, this is what traumatic brain injury looks like. Our story was so public, and many stories are with head injury, and then the person sort of goes underground because it's a shameful, stigmatized, stigmatized injury. There's just the assumption, oh, this person's retarded or slow, or they'll never be able to do X, Y, and Z. And certainly in many cases, that is the case. And I've seen it many, many times over in the civilian and the military world. But for some reason, Bob was handed the conch. And he's the kind of guy who takes the conch and says, you know what, I'm going to stand up and shine some awareness on this entire issue because there are young men and women in this hospital who don't have the resources that I have. And they're not recovering like I have. And they don't have little kids running around them to motivate them. Two and a half weeks after that, or, or into, the, into his coma and after the surgery, he got sepsis and pneumonia. And I remember his doc at the time delivering that news to me, and he said the words blood infection. And I was too stupid. I'd never make it in, in your school, Dean, to know that sepsis was a blood infection. I knew what sepsis was, and I knew that was serious. But I thought, you know, he survived a bomb. Of course he's going to survive a little blood infection. And his doctor, who was very wah-wah of a doctor, 
Alice came up to me and said, Mrs. Woodruff, I don't think you understand. Your husband is on the knife's edge. This guy needed to buy a personality on eBay. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and I said, I looked at him, I said, really? Knife's edge? I mean, well, there was a lot of humor going on, I inappropriate humor at times. I said, really? That's the analogy you want to use with me? I'm a writer. Can't we come up with something better than knife's edge in the hospital? And he sort of looked at me like, you know, huh? And I, I thought, OK, cue the humor. That was humor, Doc. It's OK. That was my first moment where I realized that I was really staying in what I called the zone. And the zone was a place where I was not going to let information in until I was ready, until I understood. I wanted Bob to wake up. I wanted us to understand what his baseline was. And we would go from there. That was the moment where my kids were asking a lot of questions. Why, why can't we see daddy? Is there something you're not telling us? Catherine may not remember this, but she questioned me about whether or not he was still alive. And in consultation with the neuropsychologist at the hospital, we determined it really, it was time. Bob was not waking up. No mother wants their children to see their father in a coma, but he was not waking up and they were asking a lot of tough questions. So Catherine was the first person of the kids to, um, to, go, to go in and see him. And an ICU is not a place for children, as you know, and it was, um, you had to gown up, you had to put the gloves on because it was a very, uh, it, was, it was a, you know, the sepsis and pneumonia was put Bob in a really vulnerable position. Really funny short story about the way kids process information. My twin girls at the time were five. And they, it was our February break where we were supposed to have gone on, on a vacation together and we ended up in Washington with Bob in the hospital. So we were trying to come up with things to do during this school break and one of the things we did was take a tour of the White House. And it was a completely fluky thing but Bush was flying in at the time that we were there and someone had texted him or something and said the Woodruffs are here and he said could you wait, could you have them wait, meet them. Once again, you know, the, the sweats, the matted hair, you know, it's really not how you want to envision yourself meeting a president. It was another ugly dressing scene. <laughs> and when my girls went home and did their picture for how I spent my winter vacation, my one daughter had a picture of the White House and herself in a beautiful ball gown. And she said, I went to meet the president in my yellow dress. And I thought, you were in a pair of sweatpants that said the end on the butt for Montauk. <laughs> I don't think so. And I realized that was the ICU gown. That was such a moment for her to put the gloves on and the <laughs> yellow gown that that was a big thing that she got to put this long dress on. So kids process things in all different ways. <laughs> Catherine came first down to see her, her dad. And of course, in the ICU, has got curtains in front of, in front of the beds. And um, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever told this story in front of you, honey, but she, squeezed my, she was squeezing my hand very tightly. And there really weren't kids on the ICU. Most of the members of the military can't afford to have their families come by the bedside or they make a choice and they have one. So we were this incredibly blessed family in that, as I have said so many times, we had so many resources. And I turned to Kath and I said, honey, we don't have to do this now. We can come back another time. And she said, no, mommy, I really need to see my daddy. So we parted the curtain, and his, the left side of his face was horrific. Not only had it, his brain swollen out of the skull, but it was just raked with rocks and dirt and another miracle. There were rocks all around his, uh, the orbit of his eye, little rocks, pebbles. There's still one in his eyelid. But none of them blinded him, um, which is, I mean, he's, he's fairly blind. He can never find his glasses or his wallet or his keys ever, ever, ever. But he had that problem before the brain injury. <laughs> I do get to say I'm the only woman in my town whose husband really does have rocks in his head and mean it, <laughs> and it works every time. But it was, just, it was just sort of monstrous, and his eye was swollen and his ear was mangled. I thought, was sure that he was deaf and blind on that side. And kids are amazing. They have so much more in their little pinky toes. And Catherine drew her breath in and drew herself up. And she sat down next to him and she just began to talk to him. And she told him about her day and she told him about soccer. And then she said, Daddy, let's play the kissing game. And that was their game that they would play. I'd never make it 
in the nursing school because I stopped being able to help with math homework in about third grade. So I would say, oh, go call your dad, Kath, and she would get on the satellite phone or cell phone to him, and they would work out their math problem, and then they would both kiss into the receiver for as long as they could, and the first one to give up was the loser, so he always sort of let her win. So she bent down and began to kiss him, and five seconds later, a tear came out of his good eye. This was two and a half weeks into his coma, and it was the very first sign we had that maybe he was there, that maybe he heard us, that maybe this would go our way. And what did I do? I screamed for my nurse. I said, get in here, you gotta see this. My daughter's kissing him and he's crying. Look at this, he hears us somewhere. And she said something I'll never forget. She said, it's always the children that can reach these guys in their comas. And at the time there were 24 young men on the TBI ward at Bethesda Naval Hospital. She said it's those kisses and the cuddles and the snuggles and the connection that a child has with its parent. And I've seen this more times than not. And it's an amazing thing. It's a healing thing. And I thought that was a wonderful thing to tell me. But 30 seconds later, I thought, what about the wives who have been here for 18, <laughs> you know, 18 years married, who sit by your bedside and say, you've just had a little boo-boo, you're going to wake up any second, it's all okay. But that was one of those instances where my nurse made that intersection for me. She took a moment and drew on her knowledge of all the things she's seen, and maybe some things she hadn't seen, and, and gave me that extra boost for what I needed. I wanted to read something. I have so much to say to you guys. I wanted to read something from a wonderful book, um, because for the longest time, I tried to think about how to, how to talk about hope. Because every time I would bring it up with my doc friends, they would say, oh, we can't do too much of the hope thing because they're going to, you know, they're not hearing us or they're going to think that they heard something. And in those moments of trauma, they come back to you and say, you told me that he was going to recover. And I always kind of like, you know, like to prick the bubble a little bit and go, really, how many times has that happened to you? And they do have to think about it half the time. And my answer is, if 999 times it worked to give them a little bit of hope, can't you deal with the one angry lady that comes in every now and then? They don't really like it when I challenge them like that. But this came from the book, um, the, uh, oh my gosh, hang on. The Emperor of All Maladies, which is a wonderful book um, about really the biography of cancer. A lot of it was way over my little blonde head, but a lot of it took place here at Dana-Farber. and. When I, when I read this, I thought it was fascinating, but when I read this one passage, I said, this is it. This is what I'm trying to say to my doctor friends about hope. So this is the, um, the resident, and he's walking into a woman's room who I think is in, a, is in a, her tumor's recurred, and she's in a terminal situation. So the doctor says to his resident, right now, he says, this patient needs something else. He, he needs, she needs resuscitation. And he writes, I watched him resuscitate. He emphasized process over outcome and transmitted astonishing amounts of information with a touch so slight that you might not even feel it. He told Fitz about the tumor, the good news about the surgery. He asked about her family, and then he spoke about his own. He spoke about his child, who was complaining about her long days at school. Did Fitz have a grandchild? He inquired. Did a daughter or a son live close by? And then, as I watched, he began to insert numbers here and there with a light-handedness that was a marvel to observe. You might read somewhere that for your particular form of cancer, there's a high chance of local recurrence or metastasis, he said, perhaps even 50 or 60 percent. She nodded, tensing up. Well, there are ways that we will tend to that when that happens. I noted that he had said when and not if. The numbers told the statistical truth, but the sentence implied nuance. We'll tend to it, he said, not we will obliterate it. Care, not cure. The conversation ran for near, nearly an hour, and in his hands, information was something live and molten. That's 
what can happen in a terminal situation. Hope can live and exist in a terminal situation because hope can be the desire that mom or dad has a wonderful ending, the hope that everyone's together when someone passes, the hope in hospice that someone's pain-free, the hope that people go in that wonderful way, that light that Bob actually saw when he fell down into the tank and onto the floor of the tank. And my husband is ever the journalist, ever a man who goes by the book and the facts. And when he lay on the tank, on the floor of the tank, he remembered this three days after waking up from his coma. He didn't remember who the president was or what year it was, but he relayed the story crystal clear of looking down and seeing his body below him and being bathed in that white light that so many people describe when they have sort of crossed over the other side and come back. And he said it was comforting and it felt wonderful and it has lessened his fear of death. When he thinks about dying now, he's not afraid because he had that experience. And I share that story when I speak to people because I think we, we you know, there are many reasons to fear what we don't know, but it's, it's, if that was something Bob experienced and saw at a time when he could barely put a sentence together, he could tell us that story. I think that was incredibly, incredibly powerful. I wanna say a lot here about the holistic approach to healing. You can't underestimate the power of touch. Touch for the patient, touch to you know the caregiver, touch to the family. I remember the moments that a nurse put, just put her hand on my shoulder. I remember the time in the rehab hospital where the nurse crooked her finger and asked me to come back into her office and I thought Bob had done something wrong maybe. And she asked me, when was the last time, Mrs. Woodruff, somebody asked you how you were today? And of course I burst into tears. And she said, I want to give you the gift of a neck massage for a few minutes, and I will never, ever, ever forget the power of that touch, because that's what I needed that day, and I walked out of that rehab hospital with my embers stoked again, with the sense that that was hope, the sense that somebody had their eye on me, even for those 10 minutes, somebody had asked about me, because let's face it, if, if the caregiver and the family member can't be ready and open and willing and hopeful or optimistic, as we talked about earlier, to take that person back into the home or whatever the setting is they go to when they've been discharged out of your care. If that person isn't able to do that, then what's the success rate going to be for your patient once they go back home? I call the four Fs what allowed us to get through. Faith, and I'll talk about that in a second. Family, friends, and funny. And sense of humor, gallows humor was so, so, so important. I was saying earlier, I read another great, great quote that crystallized for me why I felt at the time that I was sort of the class comedian in the hospital, trying to make the nurses laugh, trying to make everybody laugh. It's that ability to laugh at something when something awful has its hold on you and its power over you that removes that power if you can laugh. Here's what I want to say about faith. I think from what I witnessed that things simply go easier when you believe in something. Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, whatever it might be, but believing that there's a, a higher power something out there, I think is a powerful, powerful tool. So whether or not you believe or whether or not your patient believes, the ability to allow somebody to believe, and that's where the M word comes in again, that miracle world word. The ability to not take that away from somebody is a powerful, powerful thing. And I think Bob told this story, I was reminded at, at graduation, but it's one of my favorite stories. He actually co-opted that story from me. Um, but I was visiting down at a VA hospital and one of the young men had, had his leg shattered, probably was gonna need to be amputated from stepping on an IED. And I was visiting him at the moment and the nurse bustled in. And she said, how you doing today, Jimmy? And he sort of, you know, was fine. And she said, did you talk to God today, Jimmy? And he said, you know I don't believe in God. And clearly they had a little rapport with each other. And she said, well, that's OK. I talked to him for you. And he says he's got your back. <laughs> and I could watch this young man's face just relax a little bit. And maybe he didn't believe in God, or maybe he was just really, really angry at God at that moment in time. But someone else had him. The nurse had him. She had him that day. She'd put in a little chit for him. And that just elevated his entire mood in that moment. And this is what 
I want to remind you that one moment you have to intersect with us, the patient, the family, the caregiver, that is so powerful. You can't imagine how many times a nurse changed my mood, gave me that intersection with humanity, with a smile, with something outside that awful hospital in those awful days. That changed the course of that day for me, which is an incredibly huge and powerful thing. Another quick point, and I know we're, we're just about out of time. Don't judge the people you see around you. You're coming at things from all different points of view, and the people are coming at things from all different points of view. And I got to the rehab hospital, and I sat with Bob for a day, and I watched him in his speech and language in the little store with the stupid plastic fruit and the, and the you know, <laughs> cash register. Where he, and so here's my brilliant husband, and they're showing him a plastic potato and asking him what it is, and he can't come up with the word. And I just said, I'm out of here. And I'm out of here because this is so not helpful to him. He's looking at the plastic potato, and he's looking at me and thinking, oh my god, I'm letting her down so much. And how is she? How is she? And it was completely impeding the rehab process, because he had to worry about keeping his dignity for me. And here I am, his wife. And that first day, I said, you know what? He needs to go do his thing with his therapists and his nurses and doctors. It will be his job. And I will pick him up after his job. And I will not have to see the indignity of what he's about to do as he reboots his brain, because this cannot be healthy for a marriage. And I don't want to watch him go through a moment where he's either going to break down or whatever it might be. And I learned to go sit in the meetings with his neuropsychologist and see his progress in writing samples and in other ways that they were so wonderfully generous in showing me how he was moving along. And we all know a brain injury is the slowest healing injury of all, one millimeter a month. So those were the little ways, and I say don't judge. And I felt like, oh gosh, they must think I'm a real, you know, witch. And I felt like I needed to tell the nurses and the therapists, it's not that I don't love him, it's not that I don't care, it's that this is gonna be the best thing for our relationship. So look at it 360 when you feel the need to, to maybe judge. We talked about hope, we talked about miracles, we talked about not beating hope out of people, and I think there are two real reasons why this is so important. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but the two reasons are this. Human beings are smart. If this is not going our way, if the chemo's not working, if dad's stroke means he really will not walk again, we will begin to understand that. Our brains will begin to downshift to a place where we're ready to let that information in. Don't tell us everything you think you know is gonna happen at the very beginning. That only sets us up for a lifetime of trauma and anxiety down the road. I write really honestly, and, and maybe I'll have to come back and give another talk, but I write really honestly about, about situational depression and grief and all the ways that I fell apart later and after. And I speak honestly and openly about antidepressants, about reaching for help, because I think we have a culture in America and the medical community that shuns that. You know, oh, she needed to go on medication? Wow, what, is she weak? What's wrong? You know, can't she pull herself up by her bootstraps? And when we all talk about it, and we all help one another, and we all support one another, and understand that everybody will go through something, at some point in time, and there's nothing shameful. And mental health is mental health for a reason. It's because the mind is as much a viable thing that needs to be healed as the body, and we need to give that its own due in the medical profession. I feel like that's something the nurses understood intrinsically. I think I'm gonna close, um, and I don't know if we still do have time for questions, because I'm over. We do, okay. I'm gonna close by um, saying that I'm wearing this this sideways cross necklace, which I thought was so cool, and my daughter said to me, oh, mom, everyone's wearing those. So clearly I'm late to the party, but <laughs> it was just sent to me by a mother of a Marine who was severely injured in Iraq, and she, um, three, two years ago, after getting him through his injuries, was, uh, is 52 years old and had a stroke. And she had to work very hard to recover. And when she did, her husband left her. And she, these are one of millions of stories that you hear all the time. And families often don't make it and don't stay together after injury. But this cross reminds me that Penny 
is somebody who has a story. And Penny has ended up using her story with other stroke survivors to help other people get through it. And in sharing her story, she's helping other people. So in closing, what I want to say to all of the wonderful young people who have chosen to enter this profession, all of you who are doing it or have done it or are related in any way to healthcare or are just here to hear a lecture, because we love you too, is that the stories connect us. So don't stop telling those stories. Look for those stories. They are the currency that, is, as a family member, we live for. And your stories will give us the thing that we need to get up the next day and do it again. And I thank you so much for being part of this profession. It is truly, truly a noble profession. And thank you for listening to me. So I'm going to stop so that you can ask questions. Thank you.